Day three of the Sport Integrity Forum. Good morning, Ben Jacobs with you. This is an event put on by Seager and powered by MasterCard. Actually, behind me, you'll see the Leicester City Fox, but you might also catch wind of a orange and white football, which is from MasterCard. I've been asking all week if you know the World Cup that that's affiliated to. It was held by the mascot. If you do know, a bit of trivia, then get in contact and feel free more generally to be as interactive with us as possible. We'd love to hear from you through the app. Ask your questions during the panels. Use the hashtag SI. W. And because this is, of course, a COVID-19 era and a digital forum as a result, feel free to send a picture where you're watching from. Let's hope most of you are in safe environments and are able to function and work, but also watch the conference throughout the week and get involved with us. One or two of you, no doubt, are just wearing a smart shirt and pyjama bottoms as well. So feel free to take a photo of that. Maybe you've got a pet as well that's watching alongside you. Send us some fun pictures to brighten up our day, as well as getting into the gritty side of sports integrity too. The theme of the day, I should add, is sort of very broadly speaking, esports and betting with a focus on the US market where laws have changed relatively recently and as a result gambling in many states is legal and that's changed the landscape as far as integrity and corruption is concerned but we're also going to hone in now on a much broader topic one of the biggest topics i think we're going to tackle throughout the five days and that's match fixing and criminal infiltration in sport and this panel is called money talks the two aspects of match fixing and criminal infiltration are amongst the most serious threat to sports integrity. They undermine the public's trust on the authenticity of sporting results and sporting truth, both on and off the field of play. And to discuss this very important and, as I say, broad area, we've got an intriguing panel full of expertise across a variety of sports. Johnny Gray, CEO of Tennis Integrity Unit, Oliver Jayberg, the Deputy Chief Legal and Compliance Officer and the Director of Integrity and Anti-Doping at FIFA, Jawa Paulo Almeida, the Director General of the National Olympic Committee of Portugal, and Afi Sheikh, the Head of Integrity for Stalazard Integrity Services. So lots of expertise across a variety of different sports. And Afi, good morning. If I could start with you just for some opening remarks, where are we at with match fixing and criminal infiltration with sport? Can we talk about progress? Can we talk about a robust system to tackle this? Or are these just the kind of issues and problems in sport that are so ever evolving that just when you think you've made some progress, you have to start re-looking once again at match fixing and criminal infiltration because that landscape is constantly evolving? Hi, Ben. Thank you very much. Um, yeah, I mean, if we look at match fixing as a crime, which is what it is, like any other crime that's committed um, around the world in various areas, um, it, it goes on. Um, are we, have we made progress? Yes, um, I think we have, but it's still there. You know, like, like any other crime that we, we focus on, it's very hard to eradicate something completely. Um, criminal methods adapt to what, um, what action's been taken against them. Um, so it's, 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 it's a bit of a cat and mouse game sometimes. So I think perhaps we need to be more proactive. Uh, I think there's plenty of things we can do, um, lots of things that we're not doing that we can be doing. Um, but uh, yeah, I mean, we, we must always think of it as a crime because that's what it is. And Oliver, I suppose one thing about all sports, but particularly football, is these dual processes of justice for things relating to criminal activity, match fixing, and a variety of other topics that pertain to integrity. So very often you will have the FIFA approach in your case, which has disciplinary aspects, and then you'll have the legal approach running concurrently to it. How therefore do you balance the two? How can you see justice as FIFA, and how can you work with that broader legal system? Yeah, Ben, thank you very much for your question. I think, uh, first of all, the important thing is, you know, uh, criminal investigations and sports investigations are two, or sports disciplinary investigations are two different issues, which, however, does not mean that uh, one aspect would exclude the other. Uh, much more importantly, I think uh, both aspects should run in parallel and uh, uh, eventually, 
you know, we would exchange our findings with um, law enforcement authorities. I think this is a central aspect of uh, tackling match fixing in sports in general and in football in particular. And also, uh, we are always very happy to receive information from our peers in the law enforcement agencies, in supranational organizations, uh, in order for us to be, uh, you know, one step ahead, if we can, uh, of the criminal, because uh, as Afi said, it is to a certain extent a uh, cat and mouse game, and we must also not forget this is organized crime. So we cannot, as sport, as football, uh, resolve the issue on our own, but we must all act together. And Johnny, one of the problems, I suppose, with match fixing is in many cases it's become more moment fixing. And because it's often tied to the betting world, instead of asking a tennis player to throw a whole match, you might just say, ensure that you chuck in four double faults instead of three, and then they'll place a bet on that over under and they'll win. And it can often go undetected. So these are, I presume, some of the challenges that you personally face in trying to spot and track and ultimately punish and eradicate in the world of tennis. Yeah, Ben, hi, and good morning to you and, uh, and good morning, everybody, and uh, very happy to be here with you today. Yes, as you say, I mean, tennis has a particular challenge here because it's an individual sport um, and the subtlety now in spot fixing related to uh, online in-play gambling is such that, as you say, um, the spot fix can be extremely subtle, very difficult to detect, um, and that just causes us increasing challenges. And it's, uh, I think, as my colleagues have been saying on the panel, you're in a you're in an arms race, really. You know, as as um, the, the 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 nature of the threat evolves, so too do we need to evolve. And I'm looking forward to getting into that on the panel today. Jawa, before I ask the question, I should just point out that you're on holiday at the moment. So thanks very much for joining us. We're all very jealous because you find yourself, I believe anyway, at the birthplace of Cristiano Ronaldo, who, of course, only last night got 100 goals for Portugal. Uh, actually, it's true, but I haven't seen the, the the goals yet. As far as I know, one of them was really, really good. But uh, first of all, let me thank you for the, the invitation. And I want to, to say that, unfortunately, match fixing uh, is uh, an issue that we are chasing um, criminals and we are chasing like elephants with slingshots. Uh, and uh, may I uh, very briefly underline why? Match fixing, uh, when compared to the other integrity threat to sport, which is doping, is an issue that goes way beyond the competences and the remit of the sport governing bodies. So to tackle this issue, you have to work in a comprehensive manner, end in end with law enforcement, with sports betting uh, operators, and even with uh, other judiciary forces, because this is a, a, a serious criminal offense that has to be tackled in a comprehensive manner, not working in silos as we have seen uh, uh, until now. So it's very important to me uh, and uh, to the work that we are delivering at our NOC to underline this. Match fixing usually has been said by the world of sport uh, as a, 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 an issue of sports integrity, but uh, this is way more than a sports integrity issue. This is a serious criminal offense uh, with uh, polycriminal and transnational, highly sophisticated uh, criminal syndicates operating into the world of sport, not just for some short financial gains, but to launder huge proceeds of crime. And Joao, can I just ask you as well, specifically on Olympic athletes, do you think many are more susceptible to approaches to fix moments or matches or obviously in track and field, a race? Because at the top end, of course, one or two may be well paid and affiliated to big sports leagues, federations, but a number of Olympic athletes are part time. They struggle for funding. So if someone comes along to that type of Olympic athlete and says, do one little thing at a smaller event building up to an Olympics and we'll give you X amount of money, 
that will allow you to double your funding, double your resources, double your chances potentially of winning a medal at the Olympic Games. That is a very difficult offer to those that lack integrity to turn down because the incentive is so high and the risk feels relatively low. Yeah, that's the, that's true. And that's one of the main points of our integrity program at the, the NOC, along with the, the, the lack of knowledge and information about the consequences uh, when you uh, engage on, a, on uh, throwing a, a match. Of course, according to the vast majority of the reports, and we have seen recently an Europol report uh, about match fixing in Europe, the, the lack of income, notably in this lockdown situation, is a serious a threat uh, invite you to 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 handle uh, and to throw a, a, a match with a, a criminal syndicate. And w once you are uh, embroiled in a situation like this, and we usually compare with doping, you cannot say, uh, "Okay, I'm th that's okay enough. I'm out." Once you throw a match, you are in the end of, of, of criminals. It's much more harder to you to get out of it when compared to, to doping. So it's very important to use very simple messages to the athletes, notably to the Olympic athletes, as you said, who, they, who have no, uh, uh, sometimes they have no income uh, to uh, be really, really aware of the potential threat and the consequences of uh, manipulation of sports competitions. That's the job of uh, uh, an NOC when you are doing and when we are delivering integrity programs. Raise awareness to your community about the, the enormous impact and the consequences of match fixing on their careers and even on their uh, family lives. We've started on match fixing, of course, that's linked to criminal infiltration a lot of the time. But let's just continue to delve into the specifics of match fixing. And then after about 10 minutes, we'll move more on to the criminal aspect. But Afi, if I can turn to you on match fixing, how is it evolving? I alluded earlier to moment fixing, which is a lot harder to track. Are there specific regions we should be worried about? Are there specific sports that we should have concerns about? Um, thanks, Ben. Um, yes, it is evolving, I think. Um, and it's still, it's still a problem. And we, so take, for example, the work we've been doing looking at football. We just released our report last week that looks at football matches played throughout the world in 2019. And we've done it for three years now. So we can see, we can see a pattern emerging. We can see how things are emerging um, across continents. We're looking geographically and what levels of sport they're taking place at. Um, and yeah, I, you know, there's there's existential problems in certain places for sure. Um, you know, we've looked at football matches. If, if I if I could use football as an example, um, in Europe and Asia particularly, um, there's been um, a high number of incidences, or comparatively high number of incidences of uh, suspicious football matches. Um, I think. When you talk about moment fixing and match fixing, a lot really depends on how much money you could exploit from the betting markets if you were so minded to do so. So moment fixing, um, certainly in football, will only um, facilitate a small, a small amount of exploitation, financial exploitation from those markets because the markets are smaller. So if you're looking at uh, what we would call spot fixing, so numbers of corners or yellow cards, etc., the, the, the liquidity in those betting markets doesn't compare to, to to other sort of bigger markets in terms of match results, number of goals, etc. So it'd be very difficult for um, an organised uh, criminal group to exploit um, those smaller markets um, and, and make it worthwhile for financial gain. So I think perhaps um, what we would see in those um, in those spot fixing or moment fixing offences, certainly in football, would be some sort of smaller scale perhaps non-organised um, criminal elements getting involved in that. Oliver, how important are whistleblowers in this context? Because it's all very well, isn't it, saying FIFA need to do X, Y and Z and you'll have a strategy, you'll have a policy, you'll have a means of trying and punishing those courts. But a lot of the time, it's either a betting company that are going to see a pattern and raise it to an integrity unit or alternatively, it's a whistleblower coming to somebody like FIFA. But whistleblowers have a fear culture. 
they are often vilified, even though they are in fact heroes. So how do you, as the governing global body of football, work with whistleblowers and protect whistleblowers in this particular area? Yeah, uh, very pertinent question. And indeed, also referring back to what uh, Afi said, you know, uh, it's, it's very difficult to actually uh, find and go after the wrongdoers without uh, having hints. And uh, in this context, uh, whistleblowers are key. So uh, this is also why uh, FIFA has uh, set up uh, a whistleblower hotline. In fact, uh, different uh, reporting mechanisms by means of which you can also, or the person concerned can uh, report anonymously if uh, that in particular uh, for first contact makes uh, whistleblowers feel more more comfortable if they don't have to come forward with their identity from, from the outset. So we have a sophisticated uh, system in that context. And then uh, if uh, we receive reports and hints towards uh, uh, non-compliant or um, uh, um, behavior that is not in accordance with our regulatory framework, we would go after that. Now, the regulatory framework that we have in place also uh, protects the whistleblowers. In fact, it in the first instance uh, obliges all uh, participants of organized football to submit or to provide uh, information, to report information that may be suspicious in the context of match fixing and match manipulation. And then also we have uh, relevant provisions that protect the uh, whistleblowers that come forward. So it's, I think, a, a two, uh, two pillars approach. First, provide the opportunity to blow the whistle and then protect uh, those who actually help us in getting after uh, the wrongdoers. Johnny, are you worried by the relationship between betting companies and sports, specifically in tennis? And what would you like to see those type of companies do to help you on the front of integrity? Maybe you've got a very good relationship with them, but there is a logic, isn't there, that some of the mundane categories that we find in in-play betting that are particularly susceptible to breaches of integrity could be removed. And of course, the betting companies would turn around and say, we're a commercial company, we're looking to make money. But I personally think that if you remove, for example, the number of double faults or even aces within a live tennis game, I suspect that people would just bet elsewhere and actually the betting companies may not lose that much money by removing those markets. But if we had a series of in-play markets that were harder to manipulate than those innocuous or mundane categories, could that make a difference? I think, Johnny, you're still muted. If you could just take the mute off the microphone and then start your answer again. <laughs> Um, yes, uh, a good question. Thank you. Um, so I, I'd like to think of our relationship with the um, regulated sports betting market, market as, as a partnership. Uh, we have very close relationships with the International Betting Integrity Agency, um, and we have collaborated with them. In particular, we were talking, Afi was talking earlier on about some of the challenges during the lockdown um, of um, unofficial tennis uh, competitions and, uh, and some of the challenges around then. And there was great cooperation here. I think, I think the betting industry realizes that without integrity, um, there is no sport, and there is no market for them. Um, and it's, so therefore, it's a question of how do, you, how do you work together to deal with the things that you've talked about, Ben? So for example, in tennis, we are in the process of withdrawing uh, official data feeds from the lowest level of the professional game, the, uh, the lowest levels of the World Tennis Tour, um, because that was an area where all the other things that were in place to protect the players and so on were they're really at their most vulnerable. Um, they're just start, starting out in the game. These tournaments are held, you know, often all over the world, but in quite sort of unregulated uh, locations, tennis clubs, you know, often just courts, public courts and so on. So uh, we've done that in partnership with the data companies and with uh, the betting industry. And I, I, I think more collaboration like that is, is definitely areas we're, we're keen to explore. 
I want to turn to punishments and Zhao and Afi, perhaps we can start with you. Zhao, is there a clear and robust enough mechanism of punishment for those found guilty of throwing moments or matches? And is it equivalent? Is it stronger or weaker than, for example, doping? Because I think the obvious solution to match fixing, regardless of what the criminals do, is to at least have a consistent and strong enough mechanism to punish those. So if you're an athlete, therefore, and you're found guilty, that's it. You're not an athlete anymore. That's it. You're banned from all Olympic Games. But I think as we find with doping, there's a feeling that you get redemption, you get a second chance, you can come back after a two-year ban or however long it is. So what punishments do you have in place for match fixing or what punishments consistently across the board would you like to see? Well, actually, uh, uh, the question is not what the, the provisions that we, for instance, here in Portugal, we have in our regulatory framework. The issue is how we can enforce uh, those provisions. And when we come to that, we realize there is a, 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 a long bridge to, to get. Uh, because, uh, for instance, when you are uh, a, a sports people, being an official, uh, an athlete or a coach, uh, allegedly involved in a, in a manipulation of sport competitions, first of all, you are suspended. Then uh, the sport disciplinary uh, procedure runs uh, faster than a criminal offense. And ultimately, you will find uh, the sports people uh, allegedly involved in a manipulation of sports competition convicted by the sport disciplinary bo uh, bodies and the uh, the criminal masterminds who operate this this network they uh, not even go uh, to 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 trial and there are there are several dimensions to explain that and first of all is uh, the the standard of proof. I don't want to delve into uh, huge technicalities, but the standard of proof for on, on a disciplinary panel, even in CAS, the Court of Arbitration for Sport, is lower than in a criminal court. So uh, you you can f uh, this is very detrimental for uh, 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 sport people to report and blow the whistle because they know there are several cases in the past uh, and whenever we deliver a session we notice that people come to us and say okay you are right you are saying that uh, we should report we need to, to to blow the whistle but look to uh, uh, my case i have done that i have been suspended and the criminal guys who were behind all this this uh, this network, they didn't even face trial. So it's very very important to 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 bear that uh, uh, into account. We need to instill trust uh, 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 in the system, but to to do that, it's very important to work end in end with. Uh, um, law enforcement and even with sports betting operators because if not in the end of the day there there is a problem only for those who uh, who, who report and afi your thoughts specifically on the kind of punishments that should or are in place for athletes and whether perhaps you think those punishments need to be universalized across different sports or if you think they should be harsher than they currently are because my sense talking to athletes about this topic is lots of them do know about spot fixing lots of them have a story from 5 10 15 years ago where they or a colleague were involved and when these autobiographies come out you sometimes learn of them matt letissier's autobiography talks about him being terrified because at kickoff in a southampton game he had to get the ball out of play within a certain amount of seconds because there was a bet on a throw in and he under hit it and then he had to sort of scramble win it back and knock the ball out of play and he was hoping that nobody noticed so if so many of the these athletes are aware of instances that on the one hand suggests that more of them should be coming forward. And then, as I said earlier, that punishment aspect for athletes, is it strong enough for you? 
Thanks, Ben. Yeah, I mean, the culture is massively important for sports people to be able to come forward or think that they can come forward and there's a, a mechanism in place for them um, in which that they can uh, confidentially report approaches or allegations or rumours or, or whatever it is. That's one thing. Um, then there also needs to be the ability to investigate um, and deal with it properly. And I know Oliver touched on the whistleblowing process, and it, 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 it's massively important. Um, when it comes to deterrence, um, I've, I've long thought that the deterrent isn't strong enough, um, not only in terms of what's the, what the punishments are, but also in terms of the number of punishments that are dished out. Um, so uh, and what I mean by that is, are we investigating enough? Um, I mean, to go back to what I was saying before on, on football, you know, we, we, we identified uh, over 450 football matches played last year that we believe are suspicious. Um, so how many of those are being investigated? And of course, there's a, there's a whole load of, of stuff underneath that about, you know, where these offences are taking place, what capability is there. I, I spoke um, at the beginning about looking at match fixing as a crime. Um which, which I believe it is, but of course it all depends on the legislation in the country as to whether it actually is legally defined as a crime or not. So that's hugely important. You know, do we have a legislation framework in place that facilitates that? Um, and the other thing I would like to say um, is in terms of what Jao was talking about, and yes, it is, it is you know, easier, I suppose, to get the, the players and the, the people on the field who facilitate the fix uh, into a disciplinary procedure. Um, I would certainly like to see law enforcement going after the people pulling the strings. Um, but I think there are two blockers there. One is law enforcement priorities. Um, I'm, I'm a former law enforcement officer myself, so I know I know that you're kind of tasked to work on certain key areas that, that governments often um, prescribe. And sports integrity, as far as I know, isn't very high up on the list in many places. Um, also, the other um, point to be made there is investigative um, knowledge around a technical subject like match fixing. So how, how do the investigators, do they know how to use betting market analysis, for example, um, or performance analysis? It's, it's a very kind of technical area. So I think more skills um, can be learned globally uh, throughout law enforcement when it comes to this sort of investigation. And Oliver... As FIFA, will you be sharing information with other sports or are you open to doing that? Because one of the questions that I've been asked is, is there a mechanism in place for international organisations and federations to share information about match fixing and other aspects of organised crime? So, for example, very recently in late February of this year, there was a group of Five who were convicted of match fixing in the Portuguese second division of football and they were jailed and the roots of that crime traced back to Malaysia and obviously the betting world. And one assumes, therefore, that what was learnt from that case is those within Malaysia were using lower league football and once that crime ring was rumbled, they may well move on to other sports. So once you find something, is there that logic in being very open with your data in trying to work with other sports and federations? And if so, from FIFA's perspective, is that sharing of data currently in place? So the short version to your answer is uh, yes, there is uh, the sharing of data in place. Uh, but going a bit more into detail, I think uh, there's we, we still have a long way to go. So what we do is uh, we, in the first instance, share information within our sport, uh, down the sports or the football pyramid, uh, with our region, with the regional confederations, with our member associations. Then we obviously also have uh, collaboration agreements with uh, further stakeholders, in particular what concerns uh, the exchange of information with law enforcement authorities, um, uh, but also uh, with uh, uh, other international sports governing bodies. Because uh, the, the point, I think, which is important, and you already made it, it is one of the biggest mistakes would be to look at this as an isolated problem, isolated in terms of uh, territory, in terms of sports, in terms of uh, region, uh, 
this is not the case. We are facing here, and this has been repeatedly said, uh, a challenge of international organized crime. And uh, to, to tackle that, we, we need to work together. Uh, we need to work together within sports. We need to work together with uh, governments. We need to work together with betting regulators, uh, et cetera, et cetera. I think that is, uh, that is one of the key um, initiatives we should focus in, in future. And we are putting a lot of energy and um, uh, resources also into that to you know bring this to the next level but also what we must acknowledge is that we cannot fight this fight on our own and uh, sports in particular does eventually not have the same means as law enforcement we don't have coercive powers we don't have you know the ability to go to uh an individual and say, uh, produce your bank accounts. We want to check that. And if you don't, uh, you will face sanctions. So uh, it sounds easy, uh, you know, or it might appear to be easy to find solutions, but it's actually quite complex. And uh, that's why we need to collaborate with a lot of different stakeholders. Afi, you wanted to come in here. Thanks, Ben. Uh, thanks, Oliver. And I, I, I think what Oliver says um, uh, kind of makes me think perhaps there's a, a need for some sort of global body that ties all this stuff in um whether it's looking at sharing uh, collecting and sharing the data helping sports governing bodies to share data amongst each other um we talked about universal punishments earlier and maybe you know, that's something that could be coordinated at a, at a central level i think it wouldn't have to be i mean if how are you gonna how are you gonna if universal punishments are, are something that sports in general want then how would how would that be coordinated without a central body um also tying in investigations as oliver rightly said it's not isolated within sports you know criminal groups look for opportunities and whether it's football one day cricket the next day is tennis another day um, you know, it, it's it's not uh, it, it's not rigid in any sense of the word. Um, so yeah, you know, I, just throwing that out there, I think possibly that's uh, that's something that would assist the, um, the the subjects at hand. Johnny, just on punishments, I wonder whether you could elaborate a little bit on how to protect lower ranked tennis players, because what we find is most of the instances are from players perhaps outside of the world's top, certainly 100, if not 200. And when I look at recent instances, I'm thinking, say, Kareem Hossam, who was Egyptian and got a lifetime ban. Another Egyptian, Issam Hatem Tawil, I believe had a five-year ban, but the circumstances were a little bit different. There was Diego Matos in Brazil, only last September, I believe, he was banned for life as well. And then again, another Egyptian tennis player in Yusuf Hossam, who got a lifetime ban. I think that was the most recent and he was possibly working in conjunction with his brother in that one as well. So first of all, we're seeing three Egyptians, which means that that particular region may be a cause for concern. But what seems to be a pattern is that their players ambling on the tour struggling between challenges and the occasional ATP or WTA event. And they're obviously susceptible because they may be losing money having to travel from event to event. They maybe think if they get caught, it doesn't matter. They'll go and do another career because they weren't earning enough from tennis anyway. So how can you educate them as they're coming through the game of tennis to ensure that along the way, before they make it big, their integrity isn't compromised? It's a great question, Ben, and, and you know, I, I could spend a, a long time on this. It's fascinating you bring up the Egyptian example because uh, as a consequence of the, the, the sanctions we imposed on uh, the players you mentioned, we've entered into a very innovative partner with the Egyptian Tennis Federation who re have realised through this, and they've essentially lost their Davis Cup team, they've realised through this that they have to invest at the grassroots level uh, w with their players at the junior level to make sure they understand uh, and make smart decisions uh, as, they're, as they're participating on the tour. And I can tell you, you know, that some of the approaches, the corrupt approaches that are made to players through social media 
are very clever. I mean, they're sort of dressed up as sponsorship opportunities and the ability to come with an, you know, with a, a, an agency who are promising, you know, great things and, uh, and deals with uh, apparel companies and so on. And, you know, the, the, so making sure that players understand that you know, these sorts of very sophisticated grooming techniques, which are being used by organized crime, are, are, are exactly what they are and that they see us the TRU shortly to become an independent agency um, as there to support and help them on this journey because I think we are perhaps perceived a little bit at the moment as sort of the internal policeman and and of course that's a very important role for us but we also are there to protect the players and protect the sport be um, be be somewhere they can approach they should see us around at tournaments and so on um, where they can come and say I've had this approach you know, for this sort of sponsorship deal, you know, is this genuine? And, and we can help them and advise them through that process. So there's a lot in this. There's a lot in this about the structure of the sport, how prize money flows, uh, and, and, and so on. And, and those are things which, together with the international governing bodies, we are working on, and we we understand those challenges, and we're committed to um, moving through and dealing with them. I want to broaden it out to criminal infiltration, and this is obviously a huge topic, and we'll perhaps come on to how you trace and catch the criminals that are part of gangs or individuals that pertain to betting. But Oliver, I want to sort of define criminal infiltration in a slightly different way as well, because something that is criminal is simply illegal, but that doesn't mean that the criminal behind it is operating in a shady basement in the middle of nowhere trying to win bets. We saw that with the FIFA scandal, that illegal activity, criminal activity can be done very subtly and those partaking in it can be extremely influential figures that operate in entirely legal circles but use a sort of soft power to gain influence. And then if we're defining criminal infiltration that way as well, we start to bring in things such as bribery and it becomes very relevant to things like the FIFA scandal. So what have you and FIFA learned from that Seb Blatter era that under Gianni Infantino, you've been able to change so there is no criminal infiltration, not just in that betting world and match fixing world, but so there's no criminal infiltration to those senior figures in and around FIFA and football. Yeah, Ben, thank you. That's a, a very pertinent question. And I think uh, it starts and, and key is culture. So what we have seen uh, within the organization is, you know, a change of culture from the top uh, going uh, down uh, the the pyramid, uh, the organization. And uh, uh, the, I mean, if we look at, uh, at uh, the structure, how it has changed, we have uh, uh, massively invested in governance reforms uh, that have been that have been implemented, uh, amongst which, of course, financial control systems are key. Then also, we have uh, set up a dedicated compliance unit uh, to to help us uh, tackle different uh, different aspect. And I think also important to know is that. Uh, now going back a bit more to to match fixing and integrity, and uh, still looking at corruption. So match fixing is corruption eventually, and you know corrupt practices are only seldom obvious. So accordingly, we think that uh, education and awareness raising is key, and we need to uh, focus on that because I mean, if eventually. A match is fixed, or fixed, or a uh, corrupt uh, practice behavior has materialized, and it's too late. The damage is done, and with that, you know, the reputation of an organization of of a sport is uh, is damaged, and we want to avoid that in order to um, safeguard the public's trust eventually in the uh, genuinity. Of, of, of the sport and that is uh, not limited to football of course this goes uh, this this is valid for 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 all sports so I think that's the key message here Ciao. I guess what I was getting at in asking that question to Oliver was that 
it isn't only athletes, it isn't at the lower pyramids, it isn't only in the shady corners of the world where these things are happening. Top officials, senior decision makers are also part of the process. They're not there on the field, but they can still be influenced. They can still be asked to fix things such as major votes. And when people like Lamine Diak within your world of athletics are on trial for corruption and alleged money laundering, and that's taken place over the COVID pandemic era, it sets the wrong example, doesn't it? And if those at the top of sport are not clean, then it in some senses allows the athletes to justify their own corruption. And you kind of go round in this circle of people in glass houses shouldn't throw stones. So it's important, isn't it, that we have clean boardrooms that cannot be affected by some of these areas that we've discussed because then those clean boardrooms will be able to punish those that are guilty of corruption with a clear conscience themselves. Of course, Ben, that's quite uh, evident, because when you have uh, your reputation uh, at stake in the, in, the, in the boardrooms, you legitimize uh, wrongdoings from uh, the, the, the bottom. But to, to tackle that is very, very important, not only to have uh, good governance standards and principles in place, but much important to instill uh, notably in the newcomers, uh, in your staff, an embedded culture of compliance and good governance uh, with zero tolerance before uh, uh, those issues. And you should use, uh, uh, let's say, encouraging techniques to explain to, to athletes and to explain to, to people from the grassroots that whenever you uh, embroil in one of these scandals, even uh, uh, when you face a, a, a conviction, this is just like a stain that uh, uh, never comes out of your of your of your body. You are tarnished for 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 life. There is a, a very good example from the, the, the TIU we often use from Nicholas Kika. Uh, a tennis player, Argentinian tennis player, where he is riding in the park with his two kids uh, who ask uh, him, uh, Papa, why uh, you don't play anymore? And, and he had to, 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 to say to, to, to his kids that uh, uh, he, he was engaged in, in, a, in a manipulation of sports competition. So you should use these examples uh, to show to the other people how detrimental that can be for all your career. This is a stain that uh, doesn't go out uh, with serving time. And it is very, very important uh, uh, to deliver this in your training session, in, in your raising awareness campaigns close to your uh, uh, young kids, to your grassroots athletes. So, then you can change the boardroom from bottom up rather than uh, top bottom. Oliver, I'll come to you in just a moment, but I want to just get a response from Johnny briefly and specifically on Nicholas Kicker, because I think it's a really interesting case. His original ban was shortened quite recently by four months, which means that he'll be back competing in tennis in early January 2021. And in return for that ban being reduced. He was asked and will continue to be asked to educate on corruption within sport. And that sounds like a positive means of preventing corruption. It's a first-hand tale. It's a player with remorse. But playing devil's advocate, Johnny, it's still a reduced punishment. It's still a precedent that other players can say, well, if I do it, I'll get one ban, but eventually that ban will be reduced if I just promise to educate. And then you still have that problem of when he returns to court, a bit like Maria Sharapova after the doping incident, the other players may feel uncomfortable. They may not welcome him back to the fold. So how do you strike that balance between allowing a player a second chance, using that player to tell a cautionary tale, and just sticking to your guns, because personally, I would argue that the biggest way of educating a sports athlete not to match fix is to show that you get one chance. And if you breach that trust and chance, you're not allowed back. Um, 
Thanks, Ben. Um, well, I, I don't want to talk about the specific case, um, but I would say that uh, it's very interesting to hear from Jar that they use the Nicholas Kicker video um, it is part of their education. So obviously, and there are a number on our, on our uh, YouTube channel, uh, these are very powerful. They speak to athletes who can identify with the person um, telling the apocryphal story um, and talking about the broader implications of being caught for these things. So, you know, many, sadly, many tennis players have been sponsored by their parents early in their careers. And, you know, when they're caught, the families, you know, family break down, you know, um, and, and all sorts of wider implications. So telling these stories is important. Um, and, you know, how you incentivize someone to do that, uh, you mentioned that we do offer um, for substantial assistance, we call it, which could be training, but could also be uh, information and other things. We do take that into consideration. And again, this is not us. This is the independent hearing officers. So um, it's taken into consideration in the judicial process, which is fairly normal, you know, in, in the criminal system and in our system as well. And, and you're right, there are checks and balances around that to make sure that um, you know, substantial assistance isn't abused and it's used very rarely. Um, but in, in some cases, it's an appropriate tool we have at our disposal. Johnny, thanks for that. Oliver, I know you had a point to make. Yeah, indeed. Thank you, Ben. Uh, so just coming back on the clean boardrooms, I mean, they are important, they are key. And uh, in this context, if wrongdoing is uh, discovered, it must be investigated and sanctioned. So, uh, Yet the point is, of course, there will always be cheaters and uh, let's not be naive about that. So we must make it difficult to cheat. We must uh, uh, set the right processes to discover the cheating and uh, sanction and remedy uh, when uh, such cheating and wrongdoing is uh, discovered and improve the processes to make it more difficult to cheat in future. But uh, I mean, cheating is unfortunately, uh, part of society and uh, so is criminal behavior. Uh, what we can do is, you know, uh, strengthen the processes and make it more difficult for the cheaters within sports, but also for the criminals. And here I um, call again upon, uh, you know, uh, law enforcement to make it more difficult for, for everyone to, to cheat and to corrupt sports, uh, sporting competitions. Afi first, but Oliver, feel free to come in afterwards if you so wish. On that criminal process, do you sense that those involved in malpractice, those behind match fixing, do at times, particularly if they're part of crime gangs, try to exert an influence over the criminal process and an undue one. So whereas FIFA will work with Swiss prosecutors, US prosecutors, and then let the case run its due course, those behind the crime are actually trying to infiltrate the legal system as well, which is cause for concern. And I asked this, and the reason I mentioned Oliver as well, in reference specifically to the Brooklyn cases against FIFA corruption going on, because when you read the transcripts there, you don't just read a trial, you read a series of bizarre stories, including death threats, jurors having their water spiked and allegedly falling asleep. And when you add up each of these things, there is strong evidence, at least, that those fighting for innocence are trying to manipulate that legal system as well, which is almost a whole new crime in itself. And I wondered whether you have any thoughts on that shrewd and worryingly clever behaviour of those, first of all, committing a very subtle crime, but then when they get caught, very subtly trying to breach the law and subvert the legal process as well. Thanks, man. Well, I'm going to say yes to that um, is my short answer. And, and I say that really because, I mean, I, I, I spent many years working on organised crime. Before I came into sports integrity, I, I was working on another area of it in my law enforcement days. And organised crime groups are extremely clever um, and are very quick to spot vulnerabilities and opportunities uh, for, that they can exploit, whether it's 
um, in the commission of the crime itself, or as you say, kind of afterwards, subtly trying to influence. Um, I, I mean, organised crime is a very corporate structure, if you look at it. We talked about, I think somebody mentioned a pyramid earlier, and, and, and people at the bottom of that pyramid, but it is exactly a, a, a pyramid. It's a very hierarchical structure. And the people at the top... Um, who are pulling the strings are the ones financing it, the ones that have um, much greater power than the people at the bottom. Um, and so, of course, um, yeah, you would fully expect them to, to do things like that. It's a very compartmentalised structure. I mean, Johnny, you mentioned about clever approaches to players and they don't necessarily know what they're getting into at the beginning. And, and, but that's not just the case with players. It's varying levels of that pyramid structure as well. Um, it's strong because the various groups that make up the organised crime group don't necessarily know what the other parts of the group are doing and they don't know how it works. They only know their own function. Um, and so when people get caught, the structure remains relatively intact because, of course, it doesn't come crashing down like a house of cards. Uh, so, yeah, you know, I think, I think, it's, um, I think that does happen. Um, I, I, just one thing I'd like to add is, you know, you know we, we talk about criminal infiltration, uh, but one of the secrets to tackling criminal infiltration is not just to go after the criminal infiltration bit. You know, it's not just about tackling the supply, it's about tackling the demand as well. So uh, f for me, in order to, to totally do what we can to dismantle criminal structure, we have to look at all sorts of angles, you know, the educational process, the, the, the opportunities, uh, all of those, the financial aspects, all of those things are, are aspects that we need to tackle, not just the interdiction side. And Oliver, just briefly on the historical FIFA trial, how difficult is it when they're ex-FIFA staff, you obviously have money that's changed hands, particularly between Seb Blatter and Michel Platini of two million. You have Chuck Blazer, who isn't with us anymore. You have Swiss prosecutors. You have US prosecutors. All at the same time, whilst you're trying to clean up and restructure under Gianni and Fantino, a new FIFA 2.0. And then simultaneously, there's chances that the individual law courts in each individual country are being influenced by the perpetrators that were part of the original process. Do you, for transparency and integrity, have to kind of set back and let that legal process run its due course? Can you get involved? Is it costly to get involved? And is there ultimately a danger if you get too involved that, first of all, people will say you shouldn't be that involved because you have to keep a safe distance because you were part of it. But second of all, you'll run around in legal circles and waste a lot of time, energy and money and still maybe not make as much progress as you would like. Hmm. Uh, I mean, generally speaking, and I won't speak of, uh, of the specific procedures, but generally speaking, I mean, Criminals involved in organized crime, and in particular in match fixing, they are they are very clever, as uh, Afi, Afi said. And the entire system is uh, highly complex; it's highly sophisticated. And uh, I think there the important thing is probably also to uh, focus the resources uh, uh, within sports and uh, and outside and uh, we for us in terms of uh, integrity and anti-match fixing but also anti-doping uh, think that it's key to educate our stakeholders to raise awareness and uh, then eventually also to uh, uh, remedy and and sanction uh, the the wrongdoers that's i think uh, um, the overarching principles when we speak of uh, integrity and anti-corruption Thank you for that. I've got a legal question from Emmanuel Afi. You may be best placed to answer it, but anybody can jump in here. And it's specifically on the Macalin Convention, which, as I understand it, I'm sure bigger legal minds than mine can explain it if I get this wrong, but it's the only legal instrument and rule of international law relating to the manipulation of sports competitions and it's implemented by public authorities in cooperation essentially with national and international players and actors and the Macklin Convention only entered into force I believe in September last year what is the relevance of it why is it important and how will it help in this particular field 
Uh, well, I think th- think for me, it's it, it will help and it's relevant because it puts in place uh, an underlying infrastructure that I think is necessary. I think it coordinates the response. Um, it gets people to sign up to that response. Um, and it provides the groundwork uh, upon which positive action could be taken. So for me, it's, you know, it's, it's, um, it's important to have, absolutely. Thank you for that, Afi. Johnny, and then I'll bring in Jao. Could I just ask you on esports? I'm not sure whether it's specifically relevant to the tennis integrity unit. And this is one of the gray areas, isn't it? That esports doesn't have an overarching body. We're in the COVID-19 era. A lot of people are online. There was three months where there wasn't any live tennis. So naturally people were turning if they were betters to casinos, but also to esports, to virtual tennis matches. How do we ensure that there isn't fixing corruption, infiltration in esports and if it is happening in esports or if it's happening in virtual tennis even though it isn't actual tennis and your direct remit do you feel like somewhere somebody needs to take ownership for that area to ensure that ultimately the match fixers don't just seemingly disappear from tennis and it cleans up and we all applaud that but it's actually just because they've moved to something new and different like esports yeah, it's a good question, Ben. I mean, uh, as you know, during during the hiatus, um, we had a couple of uh, tournaments that were played actually online, um, but by the actual players. Um, so that took us into interesting discussions about, you know, relationship of those players, the betting industry, and so on, advertising and sponsorship. Um, so it's something which we we are aware of. It's you're right; it's not within our remit. I, I actually think that. My understanding of what is going on in these sports is that uh, both on the doping and the corruption side, they are beginning to make significant progress uh, as an industry. Uh, and that will require competitions, I think, to comply with certain codes of conduct in relation to doping, corruption, offences and so on. And, you know, you asked Oliver earlier on about cooperation. I think this is an area where we will see, you know, tennis and, and, and football in particular, but other sports cooperating with esports um, going forward. Jara, I know you had a point to make off the back of Afi's answer on the Macalin Convention, so I'm going to bring you in now. Yeah, actually, uh, the Emmanuel's question is is a, a very good example how things are evolving quite slowly uh, in this in this area. First and foremost, when we when we compare to to doping, and I like a lot as you have seen to compare manipulation of sport competitions with with doping, notably in the political way. We have seen that the the UNESCO's International Convention Against Doping was one of the fastest that have been ratified and approved. By by uh, hundreds of, of, of states that paved the way to the, to the setting up of, of WADA. And when we compare to the, the Macaland Convention, which is the only international legally binding document, we have seen a huge uh, deadlock and uh, the, the, the convention was approved in 2014 and only five years later it has been entering into force and that's precisely uh, there is a good example why we are facing uh, huge barriers to to clear because match fixing is a issue that crosses gambling regulation sport policies information exchange judiciary uh, cooperation and personal data uh, exchange is very difficult without uh, a political leadership to uh, uh, th- to turn things out. If we don't realize that we need to tackle this issue in a comprehensive manner with a strong leadership, we can go any longer. And to, to finalize, I give you an example. My own country, Portugal, was the, sec- was the first European Union country and second country uh, uh, was signed the, the ratif- uh, the, was uh, signed and ratified the, the convention. But ever since, one of the basic instruments of the convention, which is the national platform, who uh, uh, brings together the major stakeholders to tackle this uh, this problem, has not been uh, set up. So it's very very important to uh, walk the talk, because if not, we are uh, continuing 
to uh, rely upon uh, the will of a couple of uh, uh, stakeholders to tackle what is a huge, huge, huge problem uh, for the integrity of sport. That's a really useful summary. And Jawa, thank you very much for that. I'm just going to turn to Oliver, Afi and Johnny as well for some closing remarks and then we will be out of time. Oliver, let's start with you. Is the future bright in this area for FIFA in relation to match fixing and criminal infiltration or is there still some progress to be made over the coming months and years? Uh, I think the the topic is, I mean, bright. Well, we'll try our best to to make it as bright as possible. But as we all, I think, agree, is uh, it is a, uh, a a challenge. It is a danger for uh, for for sport, and we need to uh, prioritize our resources in order to uh, safeguard the the integrity. And what I can say is that we at FIFA have included integrity, anti-match fixing, and also anti-doping uh, as one of our uh, top 11 objectives for, uh, from a strategic perspective also for the next uh, cycle 2020 to 2023. And uh, we'll uh, work as much as we can and put uh, a lot of effort and resources uh, to make it as bright as possible. Oliver, thanks for your time. I appreciate the candid nature of your answers as well. Johnny, turning to you finally in terms of the future, I guess one of the focuses for the Tennis Integrity Unit will be to look at America and that market simply because gambling has been legalised in many states. So that is certainly one new region to focus on to ensure that integrity there is protected over the coming weeks and months, and even especially now because we currently have the US Open ongoing at Flushing Meadow. Uh, yes, I mean, obviously, the change in the gambling, you know, landscape in the US is something which uh, I think all sports are uh, thinking through. We, we are working very closely with the US Tennis uh, uh, Association, um, who are investing in this area. Um, and, and in many ways, it will bring the US into line with the rest of the world. So we'll have a, a, a you know, a uniform challenge uh, worldwide. So in that respect, I think that's great, you know, you know to just... Thank you for the opportunity to participate in this. I'm with Oliver. I mean, you know, this is a, um, the, the future is bright in the sense that I think sport, governments, uh, and everybody can see the problem. The challenge is closing with it and dealing with it. Um, and, and I think that's something all of us uh, on the panel are going to be wrestling with for, for some time to come. Johnny, great stuff. Thank you very much for joining us. And Afi, last but not least, what's next in the imminent future for you as Head of Integrity at Stalazard Integrity Services, what's the most pressing priority or the next project that you'll be working on? Uh, well, the next priority, I suppose, is, uh, is the ongoing priority of, of helping sports to combat match fixing. Um, you know, I think you, you asked a question a minute ago about progress. Um, I, I think there is lots of progress to be made, but I'm also quite optimistic, so I think it's progress that can be made. I think we've got. Um, I think we're we're poised, ready to make progress if we can overcome certain barriers. Um, and I suppose you know those those barriers and those priorities should be really uh, the kind of multifaceted approach I mentioned a, a few minutes ago with regard to how to tackle criminal infiltration. Uh, but perhaps internally, you know, we can we can we can we can do more. We can cooperate more. We can talk more. We can maybe take commercial interests out a bit more. We can maybe take the politics out a bit a bit more um, and and cross those barriers in that way. Great stuff, Afi. Thank you for joining us as well. That's all we've got time for, but if you've missed parts of the panel, it will be online via YouTube very shortly. Follow our social media as well. And if you'd like to be connected to any of the individual panellists, just reach out to us and I'm sure we'll be able to facilitate more of a one-to-one -one session organised whenever the panellists have some free time. But it's been a fascinating discussion. And once again, my thanks to Johnny, to Oliver, to Jawa and to Afi as well. Stay with us, Sport Integrity Week, day three. We've got loads more to come. Two o'clock GMT, three o'clock CET, a panel on esports, and at 3.15 GMT, 4.15 CET, we've got a fireside chat as well with Sandra Douglas Morgan, the chairwoman of the Nevada Gaming Control Board. But for now, thanks again to our panel, and thanks to you for listening as well. It's goodbye.